Before we start, I'd like to quickly review some housekeeping details to ensure this virtual forum is as accessible as possible. Please click the globe icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen to enable interpretation. You may have to click dot, dot, dot more if you are logged on through a mobile device. Next, please select either English or Spanish. And lastly, it is recommended that you mute the original audio. ALS interpreters should always be visible on your screen. For CART to see the closed captioning, please click on the dot, 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 more button and click on show subtitle. So let's begin. We are pleased to speak with Attorney General and Democratic nominee for governor of Massachusetts, Maura Healy, for this disability-focused virtual gubernatorial forum. My name is Jossie Burks Abbott, and I am, on, and I am an autism self-advocate and author. Uh, visual description, I am a black man with dark, uh, with short hair and glasses, wearing a brown, brown collared shirt and tie with white polka dots. And my background displays the logos of all the sponsoring agencies. I currently serve on the Massachusetts Developmental Disabilities Council, where I chair the policy subcommittee and I'm on the faculty of the LEND program at Boston Children's Hospital. So it is with great interests that I open today's forum. Important to note that the 2022 Massachusetts gubernatorial election will take place on November 8th, 2022, when we will elect a new governor of Massachusetts since incumbent Republican Governor Charlie Baker is not seeking re-election after two terms. This event has been organized by Advocates for Autism of Massachusetts, Boston Center for Independent Living, the Disability Law Center, Mass Advocates Standing Strong, the Massachusetts Developmental Disabilities Council, and the Arc of Massachusetts. We'd also like to thank the many co-sponsors for their help in making this forum possible, and Maura Healy for taking the time to meet with us today. The general election is Tuesday, November 8th, and on this slide, there are resources to learn more about the election and voting. It's important to announce that we received a large number of questions through our broad constituent, from our broad constituency and carefully sorted by topic to ensure a wide range of important issues are covered. If after this forum, you have additional questions, please contact the organizers of this forum, specifically those listed on the slide if you have any further questions. Additionally, Secretary of State's website has an easy to follow election information page where you can find out how to register to vote and everything else you need to know about the election process. And this slide shows additional resources about voting access. I am pleased to introduce you to Diana Hu, who will moderate questions and explain today's rules of order. Diana is now a software engineer at Google, chairperson of the Boston Center for Independent Living, and board member of the Riders Transportation Access Group. Diana, I now turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Jossie, for the introduction. And hi, everyone. I'm Diana Hu, chairperson of the Boston Center for Independent Living and your moderator for this afternoon. I'm an Asian American woman sitting atop my motorized wheelchair and wearing a black short sleeve shirt with a black flower collar. My background also shows the logos of all the sponsoring organizations whose partnership and support have made this event possible. So welcome everyone to today's edition of the virtual disability forum series, Conversations with Candidates for Governor of Massachusetts. This is a great opportunity to have a dialogue with our gubernatorial candidates and really get their thoughts and perspectives on some of the most critical issues that people with disabilities are facing in the present day. Understanding our leaders is a key step to voting for our leaders, to supporting them so that they can support us and our needs as part of the disability community. And today we're excited to have with us Maura Healy, Massachusetts Attorney General and the Democratic nominee for Massachusetts Governor. 
We'll begin the event with Attorney General Healy's opening remarks, and then we'll move to a Q&A session. And finally, we'll end with Attorney General Healy's closing remarks. Please also note that we are recording this event for folks who are unable to attend or who would like to rewatch or tune in later. We had a lot of thoughtful questions submitted in advance with topics ranging from healthcare to education, to employment, to transportation, to housing, to accessibility and more. Unfortunately, we won't be able to take live questions for this event, but we wanna emphasize that the questions we're asking today, they come straight from the disability community and reflect many top community concerns. But before we get to that Q&A, a bit of background on our candidate with us today. Attorney General Maura Healy has deep roots in Massachusetts soil, both from her family and herself. She attended Harvard College with a concentration in government and then earned her JD from Northeastern University School of Law. She later served as chief of the Civil Rights Division in the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office spearheading the state's challenge to the Defense of Marriage Act. Maura Healy was elected in 2014 and then re-elected in 2018 as the first openly gay attorney general in the country. One of her many accomplishments as the people's lawyer includes establishing the office's first ever community engagement division to go into communities, share resources, and empower people through education about their rights. We're grateful to Attorney General Healy for taking the time and the consideration to be with us here today. And please, Attorney General Healy, the floor is yours for your opening remarks. Well, thank you so much, Diana. It's great to be with you, Jossie, everyone who is on, uh, on this call today. And I, I want to thank you for joining us. I, I, I am, um, I am uh, a white woman wearing a green jacket and a navy blue shirt and I have short brown hair. My, my background is a light gray wall today. Um, I would love to start by thanking this, this community for, for the advocacy. You know, uh, some of you know a little bit about me through the, the work that we've done together in the attorney general's office. Um, but I, I wanna say at the outset, how grateful I am to all of you. Um, I remember when I first met Bill Henning um, at BCIL and, and Leo and, and so many others along the way who have helped to educate me, who have helped to inform me um, both as my work as a lawyer and, and as attorney general. And I wanna begin by, by thanking all of you. I, uh, I, I do have Miss Massachusetts roots, though I grew up just over the border in New Hampshire, and I'm the oldest of five. My, uh, my mom was a nurse, and my grandmother was a nurse, and I think I grew up with a healthy appreciation for, for caretakers and, and, and caregivers and the importance of, of that work, and that has always stayed with me. Um, I also um, grew up in a, in a small town. Um, and eventually made my way here to, to Massachusetts for, for college, as, as Diana said. Um, at some point, after an unlikely basketball career, I decided to go to uh, law school. And one of my first jobs co-ops at Northeastern Law School was working for a federal judge named Judge Reginald Lindsay. And Judge Lindsay had uh, been in a chair for a number of years due to a, a, a spinal injury. Um, and it was really through my work directly with him and we became very close friends uh, for many, many years, right up until the time he, he sadly passed away, that I had developed a much deeper appreciation for the discrimination faced by so many in the disability community. And whether it was uh, trying to get to, to, to restaurants or, or to meetings or into buildings that just lacked the accessibility, uh, I just saw first, firsthand up, up close what was happening to him. And, you know, later on, I, I, after years in private practice, I, I, I had the privilege to start in the attorney general's office as a civil rights chief. And one of the things I got to do in that division was oversee and support 
our disability rights advocacy in that unit within that division. And with some of you, uh, I worked on issues of everything from making our movie theaters and ATMs and kiosks more accessible. Uh, we did a number of cases in the fair housing space, people who were looking to, to discriminate against people uh, and their service animals. Um, we worked on, on a number of fronts. And again, I am grateful to you for that collaboration. When I got elected attorney general, one of the first things I did was set up a disability rights advisory council so that we could hear in the office directly from advocates across the disability community to make sure that their uh, perspective was, was driving policy, driving the work in the office. And I thank you for those of you who participated on that council. Together, we took on the Trump administration for undermining PCAs. We strengthened the PCA Workforce Council by appointing new members with disabilities. We also filed a bill to improve our enforcement tools to protect our seniors, people with disabilities, people in nursing homes uh, from abuse and neglect. And this is legislation that I would like to sign as governor. Um, I've been very proud of the partnership that we've had together and grateful for everything I've learned from you. As we look ahead, should I be elected governor? And I hope I am. I know we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do to make our state more accessible and fair for people with disabilities. Um, I also know that there are a few things we need to really focus on right away. Uh, probably uh, near the top, the housing crisis. Housing is unaffordable for too many across the state. And I know that people with disabilities are experiencing this crunch acutely. We need to expand our housing stock rapidly. We need to expand the Massachusetts Rental Voucher Program and the Alternative Housing Voucher Program. Uh, we also need to, to improve our uh, transportation, obviously, significantly reshaping how we manage public transportation, expanding service, uh, and making sure that our, our stations, our trains, our buses are accessible to all, and that the, the resources are in place regionally. Okay, so not just within Greater Boston, but all across from Berkshires to Hamden, down to the South Coast and the Southeast, uh, and across Central Mass. That is really, really important and something as a matter of equity that I am focused on. Um, the geographic uh, disparities within our state and what we need to do in terms of resources. And I think probably just about top of the list has to be workforce. I can't tell you how many programs I've heard from over the course of this campaign where uh, things I know are in dire shape in terms of, of lack of workforce. And you know that results in people not being able to get the care that they need. And that is something we absolutely need to address by investing in our care economy so that people have uh, the in-home assistance that they need to live independently. We need to also, you know, make sure that we are we are uh, doing everything we can with workforce across a range of, of, of needs right now. And that, you know, includes obviously, you know, looking at what we need to do to grow a pipeline, grow a pipeline through job training programs, uh, paying people well. Um, and there's just a lot of work I know that we need to, to do uh, in this space. So again, I'm just grateful to have the conversation with you today and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Attorney General Healy. I, it's really um, empowering to, to see uh, all of the work that you've done as Attorney General on, um, on, on really um, promoting disability rights as civil rights. And, and thank you for listening to our needs and, and working with us to, to continue fighting that good fight. And um, I wanna start uh, the questions today um, with a, a, an education question. And the question is this, um, how will you work to ensure also that Massachusetts schools drop the practice of segregated classrooms for students with disabilities and move to a more inclusive education for all, especially in urban school districts and, and also beyond? Well, thank you for this question. Obviously, Chapter 766 is really important. Uh, we know that segregated classrooms limit the opportunities of students with disabilities to access academic and extracurricular activities. Um, and as a result, 
you know, they, 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 they suffer and that's just not right. So we know that also that, that, that most students with disabilities can succeed uh, and, and really succeed in inclusive classrooms with the proper supports and accommodations. So here's what I think we need to do in Massachusetts. Um, and I note that just a few years ago, maybe in 2017, the National Council on Disability found that Massachusetts, along with maybe New Jersey, Connecticut, another state, um, had among the highest rates of placement in special schools or residential programs. So here's what we need to do. One, we've got to start by training teachers, educators on finding ways to better integrate special education with the regular classroom experience. Training and training and training. Next, I think we need to analyze the placement data. I wanna know across school districts in cities and towns and other communities, um, I wanna know placement rates so that we can uncover any disproportionate placement practices for students um, that are harming students with disabilities. So I think those two things are really important. I would welcome a review of how effectively Massachusetts is upholding the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Uh, which, as we know, is intended to, pr to protect students with disabilities from classroom and school segregation. And finally, I will continue to be an advocate uh, at the federal level to receive federal funding for the resources that we need in order to uphold our obligations under the law. That sounds like a, a strong plan. Yeah, yeah. And um, I also want to uh, sort of move to a question on the transition for, for when students are coming out of that school system or when they're turning 22 years old. Um, this, this marks a great transition for students with disabilities who need to move away from an educational system that, that has for the majority of their lives provided the services and supports that they've needed to live and thrive in the community. And the question is, how would you work toward ensuring that successful transition for all students with disabilities who are turning 22 and now are in need of adult services? Well, I think the first thing is let's recognize and emphasize that that work has to begin and be built out long before a student turns 22. So, you know, we need to be working on the education and the employment plans for students with disabilities long before uh, they turn 22. And, and that means getting, uh, getting uh, students into the educational programs uh, through the years that, that meet their competency and allow them to, to, to maximize and reach their full potential um, before they turn 22. I, I know that life after 22, it looks, it looks different for, for all of us, but for everyone, we have an obligation to make sure that students are uh, given the resources along the way. I also think that in addition from that being my mindset around this, the work has got to start you know, day one um, from a student's entry into, into, um, into, into learning. We also need to build up resources at DDS um, because unless there are resources at DDS, we're not gonna have the, the resources that are there to best assist our students and their families, by the way. Of course, their family is so critically important in the planning process and making sure that they are getting connected with the appropriate adult services for their individual needs. Um, again, I mentioned pipeline. This is an area where we really need to build up um, pipelines uh, for these students around, uh, around employment opportunities. and. You know, I want to work to make sure that we are connecting students with affordable higher education, fulfilling employment opportunities, um, and finally, you know, housing, making sure that, that students have access to affordable and accessible housing. So these are the, the, the things that we need to do. I think we know what we need to do, um, but it is a matter of, of driving that with intentionality and with, with urgency. And um, you know, it, it breaks my heart to, to, to think of instances where a student, uh, a young person is, is, you know, life is going to change at, at 22. And, you know, the fact of the matter is we as a state have an obligation to make sure that we are doing everything we can for that person and their family so that they um, have the opportunity um, and 
Uh, I just don't want to see instances where, where people fall through the cracks. Obviously, more work to do around employment, uh, around housing, and of course, the resources, you know, all the way through in the years before 22 to, to get people to, to, um, to where they need to be. Wow, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you so much. It, it really shows that you have a, a deep grasp of this issue that for education, this is something that starts from day one onward and just really uh, equipping students with disabilities with the resources that they need from housing to employment opportunities and onward. That's a, that's a really strong uh, plan for, for success, yeah. Thank you. And um, I want to move to uh, another question. Um, this is about direct service workers and the fact that community based programs and services for people with disabilities are they're currently facing a crisis level shortage of staff. And what would be the Healy administration's plans or funding to support wages and benefits and recruitment for personal care attendants for clinical staff and for other essential direct service workers. Yeah. Well, Diana, I know that there's a workforce crisis across so many sectors right now in our state, but perhaps no, um, no sector, sector is experiencing it more than, than human services and healthcare right now. And I know, you know, and the consequence of that, uh, where people are relying on that care, uh, is just absolutely devastating. So it's pretty clear we need to invest in workforce. We need to go out and recruit and train up uh, and develop a pipeline of future PCAs and other direct care workers. That includes building out programs in vocational schools and in community colleges, as well as in our high schools. Mayor Driscoll and I recently announced a program, Mass Reconnect, um, this is a program that basically will make job training available to residents 25 years and older who may not be in the workforce, but who could be brought back into the workforce to be trained and receive the certification to, to go out and fill some of these incredibly important positions. It's, it's aimed at helping older and, and non-traditional students um, complete their education and train them for, for good jobs in human services and healthcare and the like. And so those are some of the things that, that we need to do. Um, and, and obviously this comes down to pay too. And, and you know, I recognize that any number of people have left jobs that are so, so critically important where you're taking care of a human being. I mean, what is more important than that to go work at places like Amazon and Target that pay more? And, you know, this gets to who, this gets to what we value as a state and uh, and I value people and we need to make sure that we are there with the incentives and that we've done the work to grow this workforce. I don't wanna hear another story and I've heard too many of too many folks not able to go to day programs, not able to participate in the activities that they used to participate in simply because of workforce issues. Yeah, that's that's huge, yeah. I mean, yeah, since the start of the pandemic, there have been so many folks with disabilities who have been shut out from access to day programs from the Department of Developmental Services because of this limited staffing for, for programs and for transportation. So I think, um, yeah, yeah, it sounds like Mass uh, Reconnect is gonna be a, a great way to, um, to help, uh, uh, yeah, fuel, fuel the, the staffing so that there, there are resources there for, for these um, incredibly important programs. And yeah, yeah, um, thank you. And I, I wanna move to a, a question that um, sort of, uh, you've touched on the personal care attendant program and I, I wanna hear more about your thoughts there. Um, and the state's personal care attendant program provide services to over 40,000 people with disabilities, including those with physical and intellectual disabilities, as, as well as many seniors. There are over 55,000 PCAs on that program, predominantly low-income women, immigrants, and members of the BIPOC communities. 
And yeah, upon taking office, we've seen an unfortunate precedent where many previous administrations going back to the 1990s have targeted this program for cuts without understanding that it's one of the most vital independent living programs in the state and an important source of income as well for low income people. And on a personal level, MassHealth's PCA program is, it's one of the main reasons why I've decided to call Massachusetts my home. My PCAs get me out of bed in the morning and, and assist me with all my activities of daily living so that I can lead an independent life, not in an institution, but in the control of my own place to call home. And the question is, will you support this PCA program and work with advocates and labor representatives to strengthen rather than reduce the program? Absolutely, absolutely, Diana. Remember, you know, it was the, the team and I in the Attorney General's office who sued the Trump administration when they tried to undermine the bargaining power of tens of thousands of Massachusetts PCAs. I've been a proud supporter of the Workforce Council and made sure that it had representation from uh, disability community. And, and I've been very proud to be, I think, the first candidate for governor in over a generation to receive the endorsement of every SEIU local in Massachusetts, which represents our PCAs. I've been able to spend a lot of time with PCAs um, over the last over the last many many years, um, as well as as well as clients. And you know to hear the stories and it's a it's a no brainer. Of course we need to do that. Of course we need to do that. You were you were just you know. An, an example of, of why, you know, of why this is so absolutely critical. So look, as governor, I'm going to continue to stand up for the tens of thousands of home care workers um, who are providing vital care, uh, compassionate care, um, to ensure that, that uh, people are able to live um, independently, uh, to live safely, to live with dignity. Now, this is absolutely what we need to do. And you know, that, that includes, of course, addressing the issues of, of compensation and recruitment. Thank you so much, Attorney General Healy. This is really a fundamental grasping of PCA program as, as a matter of dignity, as a matter of um, being able to live with freedom. So I, I really appreciate your answer and, and your commitment to, to help strengthening this mm -hmm. program really means a lot. And um, I, I want to move to um, uh, another question. You touched on this in your opening remarks uh, about transportation as um, a critical issue for the general population and very critical for people with disabilities, whether uh, the transportation involves the Human Services Transportation Office, accessibility of the MBTA, uh, including the ride paratransit service, or, or adequate funding for regional transit authorities. Accessible transportation is fundamental to community integration and independent living for people with disabilities. And uh, I wanna understand what will you do to uh, improve transportation for the disability community? Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> this, is, this is really important. I've said just, you know, as a, as a general matter for our state, we don't have a functioning economy without a functioning public transportation system. And I've been really clear about my plans for that and the investments that we need to make so that we have a public transit system that is safe, that is accessible and reliable and affordable. And obviously there are projects that are, you know, big scale projects that we've, we've discussed um, in the state that I support uh, the funding for, but also, you know, uh, paying attention to the work of our RTAs, uh, the work of the ride, um, and, and other programs. I mean, we have to do this, and it just should never be the case that uh, people um, are unable to, to access the, 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 the public transportation that they are absolutely entitled to access under law. And, you know, I know this is, this is a struggle um, at times for people with disabilities um, with some of the wait times and, you know, the, 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 lack of, uh, the lack of services. So, you know, I wanna work on that. I wanna build on, I know that the, the Department of, of it's a system-wide 
accessibility, um, working, working with T in particular on advancing equal access and compliance with, uh, with ADA uh, rules. Um, you know, that, that's something that's very important and I will work to support that department. Um, I will work to support resources for uh, the ride and it's well beyond the ride, you know, it, it, as well. But this also gets to, to workforce issues because we need people who are there to, to provide these services. And, you know, I, um, I was actually at a, a, it's great the other day, I was out on campus at UMass Amherst and they've got a great engineering department there and one that's focused on uh, transportation. And what they wanted to show me and, and I wanted to see was some of the incredible work that they're doing using cameras um, that are on robotic chairs that, that help capture what obstacles a uh, person in a wheelchair may encounter uh, when getting around a built environment. And the goal, of course, is to address that and make that more accessible. And you know, that's just an example of something that's happening right here in the state. Um, work that we need to invest in and do. Um, so look, I, look, I'm the civil rights lawyer. You know, I'm still the civil rights lawyer from the civil rights division, and you know, uh, dealing with cases that have been filed where people haven't had access to to housing, uh, to jobs, to to transportation. I mean, these are the basic building blocks of of, of life, education, right? Um, and as governor, I promise you, I will do everything in my power to make sure that no person with a disability is denied any of those experiences. Wow, thank you so much, Attorney General Healy. That, that's, that's so strengthening on, on uh, yeah, on providing the resources to system-wide accessibility to the ride. And that, that sounds like a really cool innovation project uh, with the robots to, to look at the obstacles and, and, uh, and take down those obstacles. And um, it's really exciting to hear uh, about the transportation opportunities that, that lie ahead for accessibility. And um, I know you also um, described uh, uh, your support for housing uh, as, as another fundamental building block um, in your opening remarks with uh, MRVP and AHVP. And uh, I also want to jump to uh, another building block that you mentioned uh, on employment. And this is really coming from uh, the state, uh, the desire for the state to be a leader in hiring people with disabilities who as a group in general are, are underrepresented in both the public and private workforce. And I wanna ask if your administration will support initiatives to hire people with disabilities in state government, uh, including establishing concrete goals and holding agencies to established metrics. Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, uh, first of all, uh, everyone deserves the, the opportunity for employment. And um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to make sure that we're doing everything we can to ensure that people with disabilities have access to meaningful employment uh, employment that that they are going to um, uh, not only uh, benefit from in terms of, of financial independence, which is so important, um, but also that that reflects you know who they are and and all they can be about. And you know that means education. That means the resources that we've talked about. It means the supportive resources. Um, and the other thing is we need a thriving workforce in this state. I mentioned to you the number of jobs that are open and available. Um, this is in our collective interest to be doing everything we can to, to uh, grow a workforce. And you know, I think that we need to make sure that we are strengthening all the connections out there, the connections that exist between you know, Department of Labor, Mass uh, Rehabilitation Commission, Commission for the Blind, Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, DDS, um, and also the private sector, right? And, and making sure that, you know, things are synced up there. Um, and I think that we could be doing more with that. I also think that we could be doing more in expanding our educational opportunities earlier on, uh, whether it's through vocational education and training um, or other programs to give people with disabilities the skills and the knowledge they need to, to benefit also from what are emerging as, as new jobs and new opportunities um, in this state. And you know, the advent of technology has, 
has um, been a game changer in so many respects. And we just need to do everything we can to expand those employment opportunities, the training for that, and then the partnerships where, you know, employers, yes, including state agencies and entities who should be held accountable, um, but also our private employers who can see the win-win in all of this. And, you know, um, I think sometimes, you know, things that get in the way are funding and lack of, um, lack of imagination. And I'm not going to let either of those things uh, uh, impede us any further in terms of, of, of barriers for people with disabilities when it comes to employment. Thank you. Thank you for that response and, and really for, um, yeah, paving the way in both the public and private sectors to, to uh, support employment for people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I want to go to uh, uh, another question about self-direction, which is a model of long-term service delivery that empowers people with disabilities to take control of the, the what, the when, and the how they receive their services and supports. Many folks in the disability community consider self-direction to be a matter of human rights and fundamental to independent living. And the question is, how will you support self-direction for people with disabilities in getting their services and supports? Well, I absolutely support a self-direction model that, that helps people with disabilities um, and their families make informed choices. And we know that, you know, there really are, and should be, or should be a recognition that, you know, there, there, there needs to be a range of options because um, we're all we're all different uh, with, with similarities, but as human beings, you know, we we all have we're all individuals. So what is what is it we need to do to make sure that we are out there with the options, supporting uh, people with disabilities and having the options available to them to make the decisions about how they receive their care and how they utilize their services and what is going to work best, what supports are going to work best for them and, and for their families. And, you know, people of, of all ages with all types of, of uh, disabilities uh, should be able to maintain their independence at home. And, you know, I think that's why, you know, if you look at something like the Real Lives Law, right, uh, that was passed is so important. It was intended to expand um, uh, self-direction uh, services and and that and that model here in the state and so that's something that you know we need to we need to 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 support and you know I've heard um, that there's a lot more work we need to do to to better implement the law and I'm committed to working with all of you as I know Mayor Driscoll is uh, in making sure that that happens and you know I know uh, we want to empower DDS and the self determination advisory board to receive constructive feedback so that we can do what needs doing. Thank you. Thank you for strengthening DDS, the Self-Determination Advisory Board, strong implementation for real lives law. Thank you very much. And um, I know we, we promised that this event would be about 45 minutes long and we're, we're getting close to that now. And I, I wanna thank you, Attorney General Healy, for your really thoughtful and well-reasoned responses that really show a deep understanding of the issues that people with disabilities uh, are facing. And I, I would like to hand the virtual spotlight back to you once more for your closing remarks, and then we'll finish up the event and the floor oh. is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you, Diana. And thank you uh, for having me on with all of you here today. It's been great to be able to share a little bit of, of uh, my perspective on things. Um, just know that I am driven to this work because I believe in the people of our state, uh, all of the people of our state, and I believe that great things are possible here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts if we work together. And um, we have a lot going for us in this state. We, um, we have, through the years, through important civil rights legislation and initiatives and efforts and advocacy, yes, including litigation um, brought by, by some represented on this call, you know, we have got things to a certain place, but we have so much more work to do. And I promise you that as governor, I will, I will hear you, I will see you, I will listen to you, I will meet you 
where you are, and I will work every day to find ways when it comes to the issue of disability rights and folks with disability in our state, I will do everything I can to support uh, with resources, with education, with, with, uh, with training, um, with lifting up and amplification um, so that people understand uh, more about um, the, the wonderful richness and vibrancy uh, across uh, across the disability community. And I hope I, I'm not offending anyone because it is not a monolith. Um, it is uh, a community with, with, with uh, lots of variation and, and, and different parts and, and needs and the like, but, and experiences. But just know that as governor, I'm gonna do everything that I can to, to be there to support um, because we deprive ourselves as a commonwealth when we fail to recognize the dignity, the worth, um, and, and the capacity of each person in this state. And I wanna work hard to eliminate any barriers that exist when it comes to education, healthcare, employment, housing, transportation um, for people with disabilities and their families. And that is, that is something I, I promise to do. Um, and I will only be successful if um, Kim Driscoll and I are able to do that in partnership, in collaboration with all of you. So thank you for the, the, the work you continue to do. Thank you so much for your closing remarks, Attorney General Healy. And, and thank you so much on behalf of our audience and our event sponsors and the disability community of Massachusetts. Thanks for taking the time to virtually sit down with us today and share your thoughts and perspectives and yeah. really a vision. For, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. And, and I don't mean to cut you off, Diana. You know, one thing that I found really important in leading, you know, uh, an organizational team is, is, is representation matters. And, you know, I just am committing to you that um, uh, not only will we have strong and robust uh, boards and commissions and agencies that are uh, specifically focused on, on issues of, of, of disability, but I think, you know, as important, we need to have representation from the disability community across <laughs> boards and agencies and commissions generally. And I think with that, you know, we're gonna be able to move further ahead because people, people will have, people will see and better understand, you know, um, you're, at, you're at Google today. Uh, thank God, you know, you're doing the work that you do as a software engineer. We're lucky to have you. We wanna keep you in Massachusetts. Um, but I think that kind of exposure is, it, it, it is, is very important. And in one way, I think uh, the executive branch can help do that is you know who it decides to put on various boards and agencies and, and commissions across a range of sectors and spaces. And there will be representation. I will be looking for and asking for representation if elected from the disability community. Absolutely right on with representation. Yeah, I, I think this is a fundamental way to get disability issues integrated into all policy areas if, if we have strong representation from the disability community. So thank you. That's, that's, uh, wow, that's great to hear that this will be coming to, to the forefront um, with your leadership as governor. Yeah, yeah, and, and thank you again for, for sharing this vision of how Massachusetts will look for people with disability uh, when, when you're a governor. And I, I wanna also give thanks to um, all the sponsoring organizations, to the interpreters and the card captioner and to the tech team for making this event possible. And I, I wanna thank everyone in the audience for tuning in. I hope this event really gives you more insight into Attorney General Healy's thinking and policies when it comes to supporting disability rights and services and representation. This event is part of a, a larger call to action to get ready to vote for your governor on November 8th. Our organizations are nonpartisan, but we urge that the voice of the disabled be heard in the policies of our great state and beyond. As the renowned disability rights activist, Justin Dart once said, vote as if your life depends on it because it does. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.